What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast, CBS Sports Daily NFL Podcast. I'm Orbitz, and I'm your host. It is Friday, August the 5th, if you're listening to the podcast in audio form, which is the traditional method of podcast consumption. But because we're a multimedia company, and because we're so god dang handsome, we're also on YouTube, youtube.com slash pick six. If you are watching live on YouTube, it is Thursday, August the 4th. And we are going to break down some of the news from Deshaun Watson, plus get to NFC South burning questions and call out our colleague Ryan Wilson for his latest chicanery. And joining me to do all of that, back from a lengthy vacation to parts unknown, John Breach. What's up, buddy? Well, first of all, Brinson, I've been back for like a week. You've just been avoiding me. We're supposed to do a podcast together. You didn't show up. Uh, you guys didn't invite me on the Deshaun Watson podcast Monday. I get it. I, I can take a hint, man. But here we are. Oh, end of the week. You've been back all week, really? You can't avoid me anymore. Yeah. I didn't didn't take like, where, 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 where the hell's Breach for this emergency podcast? And I was like, <laughs> I think he's still on vacation. I don't know. Um, but this isn't about me taking month long vacations or you not inviting me on podcasts. It's about Wilson refusing to show up to get his oh, tattoo. Oh, 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 let's not, let's, let's, no. it needs to be clarified. He's not refusing to show up. So oh, my bad. everyone who listens or watches this podcast, um, knows that, uh, Ryan Wilson is supposed to have a tattoo, He's supposed to get a tattoo because Ryan Finley and the Bengals on Monday night beat the Steelers like two years ago. Was this even was this pre-pandemic? Was it during the 2020 season? Maybe like maybe been before the pandemic. Like that's that's how long he's been just, just waffling on this bet. Went through the entire 2021 season. Pathetic, really. Oh, yeah, it was 2020 because Joe Burrow got hurt. All right. Ryan Philly was filling in for Joe Burrow after Brandon Allen. Against the Steelers. So it was December 2020. Yeah, December 2020. I mean, it's we are. I mean, we're closing in on two years since it happened that he hasn't that he's welched on this bet. He's tried to pawn it off on Breach because Breach didn't get the artwork done, and then he tried to pawn it off of me like I didn't Venmo him enough money. Like I like I'll just pay you for the tattoo when it, when you get the tattoo. Like just get it done, I'll pay for it. Like I have to Venmo him ahead of time. He's been waffling like an out. Well, and now there's no one left to pawn it off on. Correct, and. He's agreed to get the tattoo done in Nashville in two weeks when we go. But Breach and I have noticed some more subtle shenanigans <laughs> from Wilson in order to avoid getting this tattoo. For instance, we are supposed to go there on Tuesday the 16th. Like what we, have, we have stuff to do for work on Tuesday and Wednesday of, of that week, the 16th and the 17th. Hopefully, we'll be doing live shows from Nashville. We'll, we'll let y'all know based on the timing. Most people, no, no, not everybody. Like, for instance, Chip Patterson is going to be there as well. I was texting with Chip uh, today, and he's going to be there. Now, Chip is flying in early on Tuesday morning. He's leaving Raleigh early on Tuesday morning. Chip has a brand new kid. Like, he can't, and, and another young kid. He can't just leave for, you know, on, on a whim, right? Like, he's got to hang around the house. Wilson is un completely unafraid to abandon his family for work-related activities like in, in excess. Like he'll drive to Stanford, Connecticut and spend an extra night during the season. But he has booked his flight breach for Tuesday instead of Monday. Why do you think that is? Because I have a theory. Now, Brinson, you are flying in Monday, Monday night. Monday. You live and there. I live here. So you can literally, even if there was no tattoo involved, you could fly in Monday just to come hang out with me because we don't get to see each other. You know, when are you flying in? I hope it's Monday. That often. Monday. Monday. Hmm. Monday. So all of us will be there Monday. And yet Ryan Wilson, he who is very paranoid about being late for things and would not want to arrive late for a work function, because his flight was delayed and he's got to take it, he's got to do a layover, is coming in Tuesday. Breach, my theory is that Wilson has taken, has booked flights as close to as humanly possible, the beginning and the end of the work related functions, in order to then say, there's no time while we're in Nashville for him to get a tattoo and to continue to push this back like an absolute coward. Your thoughts? 
Uh, I don't hate the theory. I don't hate it all. It looks like it's going to be on me and you to pull Wilson out because he gets in, I think, at 11.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Then you have to go straight to what we have to do for work. And so there is not a lot of leeway there, and he flies out Wednesday morning. Uh, so I guess, really, we're going to have to rope him in this Tuesday night. But we have a work function Tuesday night, so it's a, the time he's going to be dicey. But, you know, Brinson, me and you together with our powers combined, I think we can turn Wilson into Captain Planet, but with a tattoo of Ryan Finley. Yeah, I think that we can find a way to, to squeeze it in. He's going to try and welch. We're going to we're gonna, we need to get, we need to lock down a tattoo parlor close to the hotel, and just tell him like, dude, like you're not you're not getting out of this. Like it's that's just how it's going to work. You need to pay, like you lost the bet. I mean, you know, pay up. Um, so if you want to help encourage Ryan Wilson to get that tattoo. At Ryan Wilson CBS is his Twitter handle. Tweet him and say, get and accuse him of scheduling his flights so that way he can avoid just call him, call him a coward. Call him, call, do whatever you need to do. At Ryan Wilson CBS, just harass him on Twitter. Even like two tweets will get Wilson Wilson in a weird headspace. He doesn't need much <laughs> to like get him like, like, oh God. So just fire tweets his way. Everyone, if as many tweets as you want. Anybody who listens or watches at Ryan Wilson CBS and accuse him of welching on the bet of trying to sque of, of trying to weasel his way out of it, knowing he probably won't see us again until maybe like the Super Bowl. So like he knows he can get through an entire season and just catch grief from us. Like, well, what are you gonna do? I can't just go get the downtown. Like the artwork isn't right. You guys won't tell me what to do. No, go get the to harass him. Anyway, <laughs> the NFL as we suggested on the emergency podcast and as we suggested on yesterday's podcast with Sully is appealing to Sean Watson, six game suspension um, in hilarious fashion. It's like the NFL is appealing the, the suspension or appealing the punishment to the, it's like the, like the NFL is appealing the NFL's ruling to the NFL. So the NFL can make a different ruling. Uh, Roger Goodell is not going to hear the appeal. He's going to uh, have a designee, which like, do you, do you think that the Roger Goodell's designee is going to uh, do what Roger Goodell wants or not do what Roger Goodell wants? Because I'm guessing that this designee is not going to go rogue and just like not do what Goodell wants. The NFL is seeking an indefinite suspension of at least one year and a potential monetary fine breach. How do you see this playing out? I know you also may have written, I don't know if you wrote something about it or not, but you had a, a somebody had a theory on the site that, or somebody reported that Watson turned down a settlement offer from the NFL already. Um, and there's some more other like sort of timing theories about this as well, but um, the appeal is official. The, the NFL has announced it. Yeah. So I, I think there are multiple layers to this. Yeah. I just shot off a story. We're recording this on Thursday that talked about, the settlement offer that Sean Watson got from the NFL while they were negotiating that he basically shot down. And that was from, uh, you know, I think Dan Graziano from ESPN reported that on, on Monday. And it was, the NFL said, hey, look, if you accept a 12-game suspension and an $8 million fine, sign off on that. This is done. We'll put it all behind us. We're good to go. Watson's camp said, thanks, but no thanks. We're not taking 12 games. We're not paying an $8 million fine. We'll, we'll see where this goes. And so Watson basically gambled and he lost because there's no way, like you were just saying, Brinson, this is an appeal process where if the NFL was filing a, an appeal in a case where the NFL oversees the appeal process, you're getting more games added on to your suspension. There'd be no reason for the NFL to waste its own time. Um, so when you're talking about he's at six games, where does this go next? Well, now that you're in this appeal process, they could try to work out another settlement before the appeals officer. And maybe the NFL goes back and says, uh, hey, about that 12 games, you want to do it? Except instead of $8 million, we're going to find you $12 million. Uh, And maybe he's like, okay, well, I don't have a choice now because I could be suspended for a year. And one other interesting note um, I think I saw from Charles Robinson of Yahoo Sports is that the reason the NFL – was so adamant about 12 games and the reason they were willing to trim, uh, you know, five games off that one year suspension is because the league apparently does not want Deshaun Watson oh, playing in Houston 
against the Texans. Oh. And so that would be the 12th game of the 12 game suspension. That's why it's that number, not 10 or 14. Uh, so if he gets that 12 game suspension, then he comes back the week after the Browns would play the Texans. And so that would keep him out there. And then one other thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, you talk about precedent and I think it was mentioned that Jameis Winston had the longest suspension for a, a nonviolent sexual assault, which is of course is a ridiculous term, but that was at three games and he had one allegation, whereas Watson's facing four in terms of this uh, appeal, because you can't consider all 24. You can only consider what Sue Robinson considered. Uh, and so four times three is gets you to 12 where it's hard to argue. You know, I think Wilson and you guys mentioned he's a first time offender, but how can you call someone with 24 cases hanging over them a first time offender? Uh, it's just, right. it, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's the NFL's problem, why they want to put more games on this. So I would say right now that I think 12 games is the minimum and that, you know, it might end up being that whole year. I think if it ends up being 12 games that Watson's camp does not challenge it, there's no federal uh, lawsuit. But I think if it is the, the entire year or indefinite, then I think we see a lawsuit get filed. All right. So a couple of things um, on this. One, that's really interesting that they don't want him playing in, in Houston or allegedly don't want him playing in Houston. Um, do I mean, is it just like they don't? Like just the optics are terrible. I mean, is that just a simple? That's what it feels like. It, there's okay. no specifics, but I mean, you know, it, it's it makes sense on on some levels. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I also would guess that they um probably don't. I mean, look, I mean, I, I'm not speaking for anybody at CBS, but that game is scheduled to be on CBS, and I would think that even though it's a one o'clock game and it, it's Cleveland at Houston, and it might not be, it's not, it's not likely going to be Nance and, and Romo calling and Tracy Wilson calling the game. Um, it is still probably like, you know, if you're, if you're, if you are, if you're doing the broadcast, like even if it was like Fox, I would say, you know, I'd say this for whoever it is. It's like the broadcast partner's probably like, look, I mean, we, we don't really want to have Deshaun Watson in Houston. Like there's going to be like, you're going to get protest. I mean, you're going to, you're just going to get a lot, a lot can come into play. And so I would think the end both the NFL and, you know, CBS, the broadcast rights holder d would not want Watson playing in that game, or we're not want him active for that game. We're not want him near that game. So that does make a lot of sense. Um, two on the fine thing, just because I know people have been, uh, you know, even with my, um, you know, even with my like friend group text, the eight million dollars that they wanted to find him and whatever they're going to find him now, or they're going to attempt to find him, um, is based on the fact that Deshaun Watson and his agent and the Cleveland Browns structured his contract so that he only makes $1 million this year. The design of that was almost entirely to avoid knowing that he would be suspended at like to, to some length and to avoid paying a lot of money in terms of his game check. So I, I would guess that if we did the math and you chop up this year and next year's salary and then prorated over like, you know, they're just trying to, they're trying to find, and they'll probably find the Browns too. Um, I mean, they already did. Um, but they, they don't want Deshaun Watson to get away with just losing X percent of $1 million or just $1 million because they, because they circumvented, you know, the, the a normal contract structure. Uh, it, it, it's just, it, it's not surprising at all. Right. All and real quick on that is we've seen a lot of Browns fans push back. Well, that's how the Browns do all of their contracts. But Sean Watson literally has a clause in his contract that says his guarantees cannot be voided uh, if he's found to be responsible for any of these sexual assaults. I guarantee you there is no other Browns player that has a clause in their contract that says they can keep their guarantees if they are found guilty of any sort of sexual assault. So probably not, probably not that, player in the NFL. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. So <laughs> that alone makes this a, a different contract and proves that the Browns and Watson were trying to skirt him playing any huge fines. Um, on the on the settlement talks with the twelve games, could the NFL then say, "Here's what we, you know, here's here's the thing. If you've ever, uh, are you you know, you don't even have to be involved in a lawsuit. If you've ever like made a trade or bartered with somebody with something, and you come to the table and offer what you think is a fair like middle of the road offer relative to what you think should happen and what the other party thinks should happen. And you get just flat out rejected. And then suddenly through whatever circumstance that occur, you have all the control over the situation. 
Do you know what you're not going to do, Breach? You're not going to give that middle of the road offer back. You're going to be you're you're going to take it like you take it as a personal affront that that your offer is rejected, and you're going to hammer the person. And that's why I think it's a like a no brainer that Goodell's designee, and I don't matter who it is, can be Godger Rodell. I mean, like you know, just a Roger Dell with a mustache. You roll out Troy Vincent. I mean, I don't know, get Jeff Pash in there. It doesn't matter. Like whoever it is is going to be rolling with is, is going to be operating under Goodell's orders. Um, they are going to probably go for a full year suspension for Deshaun Watson. And that's, you can just expect that to happen. And I would guess a full year suspension and $12 million, um, $12 million fine. Something like that. Uh, Josh Dooley in the chat asked, um, can the P, but the PA can will sue in federal court, tie it up longer than he could to start st- tie it up longer than he could start playing the year. And the suspension, suspension could come mid year. Yes. In theory, that could happen. Here is the problem, though. The, the, the third-party arbiter has already issued the six-game suspension. So, and, the, and the PA has agreed to not um, appeal that. So no matter what, Deshaun Watson is going to be suspended six games at the bare minimum. Like, the, the trying to get an injunction would only theoretically... Uh, and look, the, the court could the court could operate differently and say you need the injunction now. I would guess they would not grant an injunction until after six six weeks had passed. Would right. Be- and real quick, because if you compare it to the Tom Brady case, the, the argument there is that because the NFLPA, Tom Brady, they never accepted the four game deflate gate suspension. His legal team said Brady will suffer irreparable harm if he misses yeah. four games because that's literally twenty five percent of the season. The flip side here is that Watson and NFLPA have accepted the six game suspension. So as Brinson said, they really don't have any legs to stand on until you get to week seven. Correct. So, and, and look, federal courts are, are, are not eager to grant injunctions to, and look, I know that in, you know, to professional athletes, a particularly professional athlete with this sort of like, you know, you've settled these cases. The third party arbiter has said, you know, the arbitrator has said, this is, you know, like you look like you read judge Sue Robinson's ruling. If a federal court, like that's going to be part of whatever is sent to the federal court on the initial proceedings. And when they, when the, the court reads that, they're gonna be like, look, I mean, we're not giving you an injunction to like, you what you, like you can't be irreparably harmed by missing games, bro. Like you've got a six game suspension and you've any damage to your reputation has already been done. So I think it would be, I think it would be pretty surprising if, if they got the injunction to start the season, that's just, that's just my thought on that. Um, additionally. Well, the flip side also is if you're Deshaun Watson, do you want to delay the suspension? Because if you know the suspension is going to happen at some point and let's say you play a few games this year and then your suspension gets pushed into the next year where you're making your base salary is $46 Correct. million, dollars, then you're losing out on a crap ton of money. Uh, so I think if you're Watson and you know a suspension's coming, that eventually you want it to happen this year and you eventually just accept it because there's no way out of it at this point. And like the Tom Brady thing is totally different too because you're talking about like, you know, this is a personal conduct policy situation. Tom Brady's thing is like an on field, was an on field integrity of the game, integrity of the game. And it's like, you know, you know, there was just a matter like it was uh, anyway, like the deflating, the like the, we're talking about apples and oranges here. But Deshaun Watson's base salary next year is forty six million dollars. He also has um, he has it when he gets his, I mean, he already got a signing bonus, but it's per over, over top of that. So forty six million dollars divided by. Seventeen, eighteen, I think. Because they get they, they get a paper paper week, check yeah, and they're by a week. That's two point five 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 million dollars per week. So if he were to get an injunction, and let's say he suspended six games, gets an injunction, plays seven games, or plays the rest of the season, I guess. I mean, is that that's probably that's probably what would happen if they gave him an injunction. Um, so uh, let's say he, yeah, he plays. Let's see, so six, so he plays eleven games. So then his the, the NFL rolls his suspension over 11 games into the following season. or And frankly, at that point, the NFL may just suspend him the entirety of 2023. And then you lose $46 million. Like, I would... I think if I'm Watson, I am probably... 
taking the L. Well, right. the thing is, if if he gets suspended for an entire season, I don't know that he actually loses the money. I think like doesn't his contract just toll and the and the Browns have him for another year? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I I'm only like that, that, that actually makes more sense. Sixty five percent sure on that. I'm not like that's I think. I don't I don't know the answer to that. And I um that's why so I close my tab. You have Joel Corey on every podcast so he can right. answer questions like that. I'm all right. Well, I'm just saying, like, I mean, that would be tw- anyway. The 11 games would be 28 million, 28 million dollars. Like, right. You're you're just. Uh, I guess I can. Um, I guess I can open up my copy of the CBA again. Uh, why don't you talk about something, Breach, while I look for? Well, and 11 games, if you take that suspension this year, uh, is about 600 thousand. So a little over 600 thousand. So you're talking about, ooh, do I want to miss out on 28 million dollars? Or six hundred thousand dollars, and I think that uh, that's a pretty easy decision for most people. So yeah, if I'm Deshaun Watson, and I know I have to take a suspension, and things are not looking good for me, I am just t- trying to get over with as quickly as possible. I don't want to fight this. Uh, NFL players do not have a good track record of beating the NFL in federal court. We saw Tom Brady try to do it, and even though he got handed his suspension in 2015, and he was able to push it off for a year. He did eventually serve it uh, those four games in 2016. We saw Zeke Elliott try to get it pushed off. It, it, he, he was fighting and fighting. He played at the beginning of the season. And then in November of that year where he was supposed to serve his suspension, he just said he gave up. He knew the ultimate path was him missing games. And that's what it is. You can push it off. Maybe you push it off for a year, but it's eventually going to happen. We saw Adrian Peterson, same thing. Uh, so, yes, you can fight the NFL, but you – and you can try to delay the inevitable, but it will not happen. You will eventually lose. Uh, and it's because, blame your own players association. They agreed to the collective bargaining agreement. And that collective bargaining agreement says that Roger Goodell or the person he designates has the final say over the appeal. And that's all the judge is going to see. Look, you gave Roger Goodell that power. He's using that power. What do you want me to do? My hands are tied. He gave you the four-year suspension. Uh, good night and good luck, sir. That That is basically what's going to happen. I don't, um, so it's so hard to like quickly read through the CBA. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't see it. Exactly. Impossible. I, I'm pretty sure that, I mean, if you're suspended for something you do on the field, you don't get paid for those games. I, I don't think you, I think you lose the money. That's why they're fining him. Like, like right. if, if he didn't lose the money, the Browns wouldn't have structured a contract that way. You know, if it just told the Browns wouldn't have done it one. And well, four. that's because, well, the Browns only thought he was going to be suspended for six to eight games. I didn't think he was going to be spent suspended for an entire year. Yeah. But I mean, like your con like a full game year suspension doesn't tell your contract. I don't think. I, I, don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That could be like Calvin. Like, do you think Calvin Ridley? Calvin Ridley's definitely told. Um, I do know that. It's and I just dropped a tweet in there to show you that one. So. Interesting. Um, but it's so if Watson serves some of the suspension this year, not all of it, say just five games, like you said, just because it's a year long suspension, right? So because they never played that year, so it's like they were never they never f- fulfilled any obligation of their contract. Hmm. I know. I just there's 400 pages in CBA, Brent, and if we sat here and read through them all right now, it would take four. Uh, hold on. Here's, uh, here, um, let's see. Oh, God, so I get out of my f- freak. Oh, I almost, almost kind of said a cuss word. Yes, as Brinson and I just said, Calvin Ridley's contract definitely tolls. Stop. So, for you, go away. So he is under contract with the Falcons for 2023. But that was also, I believe, a one year deal. Um, yeah, there you go, Brinson. Mm, okay. Um, well, we'll figure it out. Anyway, the, we'll, uh, we'll have a whole show on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, but I would. Yeah. Anyway, the um, yeah, the NFL. The, OK, I derailed. That's that's the Deshaun Watson situation. That's where we stand. The I would think that it will be next week. So here's the other thing, too. And Sully and I talked about this a little bit. If Roger, if Roger Goodell, whoever Roger Goodell's appointee is, designee is is going to hammer Watson. Like the NFL considers this good news. You know what I mean? Like they're like, ha, look at us. We are standing up for bad guy, standing up against bad guy. 
And so I think that the news will actually come out earlier in the week and will not be like a Friday 4 p.m. news dump. Just when like, they announce the appeal decision? Yeah. Like, I don't think and, it'll be done by tomorrow. Well, no, it won't be done by tomorrow because you, gotta file, you have to file your actual like documents. Well, Watson's side has until Friday to respond to the appeal. You so can, the NFL can't. The NFL has put in its appeal, like its physical appeal. Right. And then and then Watson's camp gets two days. So the NFL filed appeal on Wednesday. Watson's oh, camp gets that's on why they, Friday. That's why they did it on Wednesday instead of waiting until Thursday. Because if they did it Thursday, then Watson's camp would have had through the weekend. Yes, yeah, so you do it Wednesday, then you have to get it in by Friday. And you expedite the process here. And then I would think we would see a decision by the end of next week. Yeah. So you're probably having to hear your I don't know if there's an actual hearing. Hey, there probably is a hearing. You go, you file your documents, you go and have the hearing and on, let's say Monday, um, and then Wednesday or Thursday, maybe we get the, the ruling, but they'll, they will make, they will want it to be, they will not want it to be something that bleeds into the weekend. Trust me, the NFL, I mean, it could be Friday at four 30, just because sometimes that's how the timing works, but the NFL would prefer this news to come out. And maybe even, I mean, we saw them file the appeal on Wednesday this week because I, the, the thought is that they didn't want to overshadow the Hall of Fame game correct? or the Hall of Fame ceremonies. And so if they have the same thought process next week, maybe they release decision on Wednesday again because you have preseason games on Thursday. Beautiful. The Browns play on Friday, and I think you definitely want to have the decision in before the Browns hit the field. So Absolutely. Well, yeah, unquestionably. All right. So that's sort of where we're at with uh, Deshaun Watson. We'll have clearly have much more coming down the pipe in terms of that as we await uh, news on the Deshaun Watson front. You know, he almost played for two teams in the NFC, NFC South breach. He didn't. What? No. Yeah, almost. Um, Is this a segue? It was, it was a segue into a break, which we're going to take now and then come back and talk about the NFC South. Next. So the NFC South. Uh, burning questions. And if I were the NFC South, burning questions. I'm, I'm trying to get the I'm trying to see who wrote the article. Because I'm guessing I believe it was Jared. I think you're wrong. wrong. No. I think it was uh our old friend Patrick Edward, Walker. Patrick Walker. There you go. Um yeah, that's 2021. You just linked us, Breach. What? Yeah. That's last. No. Year. Oh my God. Good thing, you, good thing you're in charge of this and not me. Uh, so Patrick Walker wrote this, and we start with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Oh, fun for us. He actually only did one question for each team. Everyone, uh, and also uh, Patrick Walker of DallasCowboys.com. That's right. Yeah, our buddy moved on to DallasCowboys.com. That's right. also not true, Brinson. Did three questions per team. Okay. Um, you see three? No, I'm seeing one. This is from. Give me a link. This is we're really doing a great job here. Falling apart. We're falling uh, apart. Absolutely melting down. We need Wilson. I know. We need this. Okay, I'm only seeing one on each of the, of the, of the story, but whatever. I, I see. I see the multiple on the on the on the. No, no, no I see those Devo that you're currently grabbing from the sheet. I see those. I'm just saying the article I clicked on only had one. Anyway, the number one question for the Bucks: Can Tom Brady do it again? What is it? Mm. Mm. What is it? I'm guessing it is win the Super Bowl. Ah, I was thinking film a commercial. I mean, that can he marry a supermodel? Because he's done it. Two supermodels is a lot of supermodels. He didn't marry Bridget Moynihan. No, I don't think he did. Yeah. Um, I, yes, I think you're right. I think it probably means can he win a Super Bowl again? And the answer is yes. Although I would say I'm a lot less convinced that Tom Brady is going to win the Super Bowl today in the in early August than I was a month ago. And it frankly, it mostly involves Ryan Jensen getting hurt and sort of it looking like the receivers, like Chris Goblin, maybe not being ready to start the season. I know they added Julio Jones, but um, yeah, the offensive line issues are like he has had an, an outstanding offensive line the entire time he's been in Tampa Bay. And now it's possible that he it's likely it's almost factually true that he's going to have his worst offensive line that he's had since he got to Tampa Bay. So yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most underrated storylines, the off season before the Ryan Jensen injury was that Brady lost 
both his starting guards. Alex Kappa ditched Tom Brady and went to Cincinnati. Um, and then obviously Ali Marpet retired. So you're out already out two starting guards. You throw in Ryan Jensen, you throw in what you just mentioned with the Chris Godwin injury. Gronk retired. Uh, and Domica Sue is gone. It, him and his six sacks on that defensive front gone. Um, there are just a lot of question marks here. And I don't think this Buccaneers team is as good as they were last year. I mean, lucky for them, they're in such a bad division. I think they'll get to the playoffs. But I don't think, and it's, you know, the other part of this is because of all this Tom Brady tampering uh, controversy is that if the Buccaneers struggle out of the gate, I, things could get a little dicey in that locker room, maybe. Because think about it. You had Brady talk Leonard Fournette into coming back, correct? Who else? He talked Ryan Jensen into coming back. Yep. If, if those guys knew that Tom Brady was trying to jump ship in December to go to Miami, do you think they would have listened to anything he said? Mm. Like, like, man, how can I take you seriously? You were trying to leave the team. Why can't I leave the team? And so, he got Chris, just, they, they, I guess they franchise tag Chris Goblin, but then, like, you know, Brady definitely was talking to him, like, hey, bro, like, you right, know. sign the long term contract. So, and, it's, and, they, and they might think, like, man, this guy's going to bounce after this year and like go play for the Dolphins. And I'm going to throw out that Wilson has been just his favorite uh, storyline this year is the Buccaneers are going to fall off a cliff, they aren't going to make the playoffs and that they're going to be lucky to win nine games. And you look at those first four games, it's at Cowboys, it at Saints. Brinson, or, uh, Brady has never beaten the Saints in the regular season as a Buccaneer. And then they play the, the Packers and the Chiefs. So you have uh, possibly 0-4. I would say 2-2 two and two is their best case. In, maybe 3-1. and one, But 2-2 two and two feels like probable here. And, you know, what happens if this Buccaneers team slips out of the gate? Yeah, I, I, I that's that's a good point. You start getting maybe get some injuries. You start one and three. People are wondering is, is Tom committed to the season? Because Sully was on here pointing out that, you know, Tom Brady was talking to the Dolphins as early as 2019. And that it felt he felt like it showed up in his 2019 play. Like there was, you know, there's buzz like later that maybe like Brady's not committed to the Patriots. And so, you know, final year of his deal, just like it is in Tampa. Will he will he be focused? You know, he he he, he sort of said too several times that the Bucks kind of forced his hand into coming out of retirement because they were, they gave this artificial deadline about free agency. We're going to pursue other quarterbacks. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, I, my, my gigantic Bucks future to win the a a NFC South, I still feel good about, but I'm a little, a little more nervous about than I was a month ago. We're going to have to uh, jump on the Wilson bandwagon and, and anti Buccaneers bandwagon. Well, I have the Bucks at like plus 110 to win the division. So, oh, that's good. Yeah. Cause it was when Brady retired for like 30 minutes. Okay. Um, you will. will number question number two from our pal Patrick Walker. Will Todd Bowles rebuild his brand as an NFL head coach? Uh, obviously, you do have a new coach in place. Bruce Arians out, coincidentally or not, after Tom Brady unretires. Todd Bowles is given the reins. The former Jets coach um, got the job over uh, 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 Byron Leftwich. I was supposed to say Byron Nelson. Um, Byron Leftwich and uh, and and. You know, look, Todd Bowles has experiences as, as a head coach, so it wasn't entirely surprising. I, I think the answer is yes to this. I, just because a Todd Bowles, to me, and, like, I know, like, lots of Jets fans who disagree with this and lots of, like, Nick Costas always tells me I'm crazy for thinking this. I thought Todd Bowles was okay with the Jets and just really was dealing with, you know, just horrific management. Mike McCagnan was his guy, I believe. And, I mean, it was just horrendous draft choices under Mike McCagnan. And it was the Jets. Like, nobody – who was – I mean – Rex Ryan was the last guy to have to have any success at all with the Jets, and he still flamed out. Like you just don't win there, and you shouldn't take the Jets' job just like you shouldn't take the Browns' job or, frankly, the Raiders' job. Sometimes um, it's hard to win, and I think Bulls will have a lot more success in this first season with Tom Brady. Yes, he he could start slow, and yes, it could all fall apart as Wilson thinks. But I, to me, Bulls is a good enough head coach to make this work in this division, where even if you go twelve and five, you're probably winning the division. Yeah, but the flip side of that is what we were just talking about, where if they're bad this year, guess who's getting blamed? Todd Bowles. And so to come back and, and have that happen would be horrible for his brand as a head coach. And there's a lot of pressure. I mean, if, if the Buccaneers win just 10 games this year, I think that their season would be viewed as a failure. If they, 10 and 7 if, season would be a really bad season for the Bucs. Right, 10 and 7, and they don't advance in the playoffs. So I think it's going to be tough for him. This is not an easy situation to be in. And I don't think you can really help your brand. If Tom Brady's your quarterback, you don't really help yourself unless your team ends up winning the Super Bowl. And I don't think 
this team is good enough to win the Super Bowl. So, uh, well, twelve or thirteen wins, and he's and he's getting it. it yeah, yeah, definitely. But I don't think they're going to do that either. So I, I don't think that he's going to help or hurt. I, I think it's just going to be. Uh, he had Tom Brady. He did what he was supposed to do. They went eleven and six, and they made it to the divisional round. Mm. And then after that, you know, Brady's uh, probably he's got one foot out the door. He's not going to be back in twenty twenty three, almost certainly. And then Bowles is stuck with who? Kyle Trask, Blaine Gabbert. Then that's when the uh, that's when we see how good of a coach Todd Bowles. Yeah, I know. It's like you, you it's like you great. You, you get Brady for one year. And that's great, but um, <laughs> a little dicey. Uh, yeah. Will number question number three for the Bucks? Will Rob Gronkowski go back on his word? Uh, Gronk has denied that he will return, even if Tom Brady calls him. Maybe it's just Tom was trying to go to Miami, but Gronk's uh, lovely uh, lady friend, uh, Camilla Kostek. Did I get that right? Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Sure. Camille Kostek, I think. Camille Kostek. Oh, okay. I, I was close. And uh, his uh, very famous agent, Drew Rosenhaus, have both said that they both implied that Gronk's going to come back and play. And so that leads me to believe that Gronk is cool with playing but doesn't want to deal with the ramp up to the season and doesn't want to play a full season because he's old and his body hurts, especially right now. And he likes to party in the off season and doesn't want to deal with training camp. Um, but those, both those parties want him to make money. And when your agent and your girlfriend both are like adamant that you should play and you, and Tom Brady's like the guy you're going to play for, you're probably going to play at some point. So my guess is uh, yes, he will go back on his word and play. I'll say over under eight and a half games and I'll take the over. I will also take the over. And yeah, I think Camille Kostek saying it means more than Rosenhaus just yeah. because Rosenhaus said at the very beginning of the retirement, Kostek said it a month into it. And if, you know, if Gronk has one confidant, it's his girlfriend. And if she's out here saying, yeah, I think he's going to return him and Tom Brady were just playing silly games uh, with all this fake retirement stuff. Yeah, I, I think Gronk comes back and I, you're over under. I like it. I think he plays at least 10 games. I mean, who knows? Maybe six this retirement. He's been pretty adamant about it. But yeah, you know, and let, let's be clear too. If the Bucks are playing poorly, right, right, then Rob Gronkowski's not coming back out to like get like beat up for a you know six and eleven team or whatever. Right, right. Wilson thinks are going to go eight, nine and eight. Maybe is that, is that like what does Wilson think they're going to do? Like five, nine and, and eight, nine and eight so ish. Nine and eight's a bad season for any a Tom Brady team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the New Orleans Saints. The number one question from Patrick Walker. Can Jameis Winston deliver? Like, can he be a Jimmy John's guy? Or, you know, <laughs> I love Jimmy John's, by the way. You like Jimmy John's preach? You know, I'm not a big sub person. I, I don't mind Jimmy John's, but. I'm a beach club guy. Just there. There's too much bread. There's, there's a lot of bread. bread. You can get the flat bread now, which is a little bit better, but it's too much bread. You don't like bread? Yeah, I mean, bread's okay. I like bread in limited quantities. Interesting. Interesting. I like waffles. Waffles are bread, right? Yeah, waffles are indeed bread. I love waffles. I will just eat waffles thick, for every meal. Thick, thick bread. Lots of bread and waffles. Uh, would you eat a waffle sandwich? Oh, I love a waffle sandwich. Like, I, I, I will make those. Hot honey that's my breakfast sandwich, man. Put put the eggs in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, last night for dessert, I had a protein waffle with a small scoop of ice cream on it. That was just, I will put, I, every, waffles are everything to me. All right. It should be a spokesman. If Ego, anyone from Ego's listening, sponsor the podcast or call me. I'll wear an Ego shirt. Love the waffles. Love Clip, all waffles. Clip and save that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I waffles are everything to me. <laughs> John Breach. Um, anyway, look, I, you know, I, I think it depends on who you've got on the podcast, like who you're talking to about this, because Wilson is adamant that Jameis Winston had the best season of his career and he was incredible for the Saints last year. And I'm like, oh, he's fine. Like he, I mean, he had he had a, he had a lot of touchdowns. But they were like, it was like all, all concentrating that weird week one game where he threw like five, he had like 98 passing yards and five touchdowns. Um, I I think that Jameis can be good for the Saints, but with no Sean Payton there, and look, I know Pete Carmichael has been working with Sean Payton for a long time, but you're still taking away one of the best offensive minds in really the history of professional football in Sean Payton, a guy who is one of the best play callers in the NFL or was until he, he walked away. Um, and I, I am hesitant to suggest that Jameis Winston is going to step in off an ACL and just magically be this efficient quarterback that everybody wants him to be without Sean Payton there to really put the, the, the reins on him. So uh, I'll say, I, I don't think so. I don't think Jameis is going to do what people think he's going to do. Yeah, I think you're right that maybe Jameis is being a little overhyped because of 
We saw a small sample size. It was with Sean Payton. And, you know, he was highly efficient. You mentioned the five touchdown passes. That was on 14 completions. So literally five of his 14 completions were touchdowns. But, you know, he only threw for 148 yards. He wasn't asked to do very much. And I think that is going to be the difference. Look, we don't even know if Alvin Kamara is going to be on the field in week one. He's still dealing with this Las Vegas court case where he literally got arrested after the Pro Bowl, uh, you know, because he had that worn house for his arrest. And if Kamara's not out there, we don't know about the health of Michael Thomas. We'll talk about that in a second. And so Jameis Winston is missing a lot of offensive help. And, and Kamara's just such a big weapon. Yeah, I'm, I'm tending to agree with you, Brenton. I do not think Winston's going to have a huge year. I mean, he completed 59% of his passes in those seven games. He threw 14 touchdowns and just three interceptions. The three interceptions is great, but like nine of the touchdowns came in two games, five against Green Bay in that 38-3 win where like he just didn't – had 148 passing yards, 14 to 20. Like he didn't even need to be throwing like three of those touchdown passes. Uh, and then the other four came against uh, Washington on the road, you know, 15 to 30 completion percentage, four touchdowns and, and, and a pick. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I, I think anyone suggesting that Jameis had was like awesome to start the season is, is, is reaching there. So I, I'm not very high on, uh, Jameis Winston. This season. Look, I, I think he's better than Taysom Hill. Don't get me wrong, but I, I'm just not very high on this season. Uh, is Michael Thomas, is he better than Andy Dalton? Uh, I would take him over Andy Dalton, but cause Andy Dalton's the backup quarterback there. Um, is Michael Thomas still a force to be reckoned with? Uh, I'm going to say no. I, I just like his, he had this ankle injury, these leg injuries, and his health is just completely taken a nosedive. We have not seen him on the field in an NFL game since mid 2020. And so you don't know how good he is. You, he doesn't have Drew Brees. I mean, he was Drew Brees' security blanket out there. And, I just don't know that you can take that much time off as a receiver, come back to a quarterback who's not as good as the one you had and, and still be as good. So I, I like, I think he'll still be productive, but I do not think he is still, uh, you know, a top five receiver like he was in 2019. Yeah. And again, like part of that is Jameis Winston. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Drew, Drew Brees was the master of like hammering Michael Thomas with those slants. I don't think he's going to be nearly as productive with, with, uh, Winston under center. You also have the addition of Chris Olave. Jarvis Landry is there. And so, you know, it's going to take away from him. I, I would be very surprised if he is the same guy that he was, like you say, Breach, um, when, at, at the height of his powers when he got that huge contract. So my, 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 would be, my, answer, my answer to this would be no, although I still think he can be a very viable wide receiver. Um, I, you know, I'm probably going to get torched by him in fantasy because I'm just not going to draft him. Mm -hmm. if, his, if his ADP keeps going up, but you know, what, what, what can you do? Uh, can Dennis Allen get off to a hot start in the post Sean Payton era? Question number three from Patrick Walker. Um, I mean, that is not going to be easy. They I mean, do, I, have do we, do we think he's saying like for the year or for like the, like for like, like, can he get off to like a 12 and five start? Or is he saying, can he get off to a, um, like, if we're looking at the whole entire season, I don't know. But if we're talking about maybe the first six weeks, it's plausible. I mean, they play the Falcons. They play the Panthers. They play the Seahawks. Those are three very, very winnable games. And then if you pull an upset and one of the other three with the, the Vikings, Buccaneers, and Bengals, then you're four and two. So uh, maybe they get off to a hot start to start the season. But I don't know that he's going to be able to get off a hot start and continue what Peyton's been doing by winning uh, 10, 11, or 12, or even 13 games this year. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a viable schedule. Like, it, you know, especially if Deshaun Watson's gone for the whole year, they get, they're get at the Browns on Christmas Eve. You have know, the Panthers twice. You, you feel like you should win both of those. The Falcons twice. You feel like you should win both of those. Although I don't think it's guaranteed that they win both, right? I mean, Sean Payton and Jameis Winston went to Carolina and lost to Sam Darnold and Matt Rule last year. I mean, they have an eight-game stretch starting with the Bengals, I think, yeah. in... It's, it's a hard stretch. Week six, where I don't think... Standing where we are right now, I don't think I would pick the Saints to win a single one of those games. Uh, Bengals at home, at the Cardinals, Raiders at home, Ravens at home, at Steelers, Rams at home, at 49ers, at Buccaneers. That's brutal. That's, that's like where you go two and six and your season falls apart. Right. Um, but before that, yeah, I mean, look, you get the Falcons, Bucks, 
with the Bucks. Tom Brady's never beaten the Saints. Panthers, Vikings at home, Seahawks at home. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Dennis Allen needs to get off to a hot start. Yeah. Like if you if you start out two and three, and then you have that stretch that we're talking about, you could very well be four and nine. And you you've given up your first round pick for next year in order to get another first this year to try and show up your tackle position. Now look, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong and Sean Payton doesn't matter as much as, as pe- people don't seem to think Sean Payton matters. I think Sean Payton matters a lot. And I think we'll find out fairly quickly. All right. Carolina Panthers. Um, was this was this uh, article written before Baker Mayfield was traded? Nope. nope. Afterwards, is Baker after. Mayfield the, after, is Baker Mayfield the week one starter? Uh, the, the easy one for me. Yes. Yes. Moving on. I mean, we that's uh, if that's Baker, if Baker Mayfield loses the battle to Sam Darnold. It, it, it means the Panthers are in deep, deep doo doo. And, well, and then also, you don't trade if you like Sam Darnold and you're the Panthers coaching staff. You don't make a trade for Baker Mayfield. So this, you just you don't acquire another quarterback. You don't, if you you like don't quarterback. trade yeah. for Baker so he can sit behind Sam Darnold, who you already traded for. So yes, um, is Baker Mayfield the answer for the future? A follow up. Um, maybe I was real quick. I'll say on this is that I feel like the worst case scenario for the Panthers is if they go, if they win between seven and nine games with Baker Mayfield, because you have to decide if you're going to keep them. And if you win, probably probably what they're going to do, by the way, it's like, but like if you win just seven games, obviously that's not great, but it's a two game improvement over what you had last year. But how much money are you going to give Baker Mayfield? You hit him with a franchise tag. You you don't want to reward him with a $40 million a year contract when he only won you seven games. Right. And so I think that makes things dicey. If he wins three or four games, then it's like, all right, we're moving on. We'll find someone else next year. Right. But Baker if they Mayfield even want to stay in Carolina. Right. It, well, and then if they won 10 or more games, then you say, name your number, Baker. We'll give you whatever you want. So uh, I think it just definitely depends on how they do this year. If they make the playoffs, then he's getting franchise tagged. Or the, or they work on a contract extension mid year, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think Baker would be interested in that if if he gets to Carolina and enjoys it. It's also possible he gets to Carolina. He's like, what a disaster this place is. I'm out. And you know, go and replace Tom Brady in Tampa. You know, go and replace Tua in Miami, or you know, whatever you want to do. There's gonna be options out there. Go, you know, right. maybe the Lions want him. Who knows? Anyway, uh, can Matt Rule climb off the hot seat? Um, <laughs> um, yes, if <laughs> if they win nine games, I mean, I, I was the seven games get Matt Rule fired, seven to nine get Matt Rule fired. I think no, no, I think if they win seven, I think he keeps his job because if you're Tepper, what you want to see is that the team's improving. And if he's won five games in three straight seasons, I think if he wins five again, that gets him fired. Like Tepper's going to be like, we're not a 5-1 team. And and that's all you've been doing. Or, or, or the Panthers have won five games, three straight seasons. Two of those have been with Rule. And so I, I think five gets him done. Six is dicey. I think seven, he keeps his job. Okay. I, I think I think seven and nine is going to be... but. It, it depends on how the seven and nine is too. Like a seven and nine where you lose some close games and Baker looks good and seven and ten, Brenton. Seven and ten. God so damn, seventeen games. Oh, it's gonna take another ten years for me to, to get it right. Twenty like constantly. And by well, then, let me ask you this: do, do you, Browns Panthers Week One, who wins if Deshaun Watson's not playing? Uh, he, first of all, he's not gonna be playing. Okay. And second of all, the Panthers are gonna win. Okay. Panthers Giants Week Two. Panthers. Who, who's your pick right now? Panthers. Panthers, Saints in Charlotte, week three. Panthers, three and oh, Panthers. Three and oh. They started Panthers, three and oh last year, Breach. <laughs> Cardinals in Charlotte, Eastern time zone, 10 a.m. star without DeAndre Hopkins. Panthers, four Cardinals. And oh, wins. Four and oh, Carolina Panthers. It's not that implausible. It's crazy. <laughs> they started three and oh last year and finished five and 12. That is true. <laughs> so, I mean, and that kind of start, I think, would get uh, rule fired if that happens again. Right, right, right. That's true, too. Like, a, a seven and ten, where you start four and zero, oh, is so much worse than a seven and ten where you start one and ten. Right. 
Because you like you win six games to close out the season. You're like, all right, you know, like Baker's playing great. Like we bring it back, we keep this thing rolling. Like we may, we got something cooking here, guys. And then, yeah, and, and then, yeah. So, right, all right. Moving along to the Atlanta Falcons. Falcons. <laughs> Number one question for the Falcons: Can they be competitive in 2022? <laughs> If they were in any other division, I would say no, but the NFC South is just so, it's not bad, it's just mediocre. And so I feel like they could sneak a few wins. I don't know what competitive is. Is five wins competitive? I think they can maybe win five games. Um, I don't think five games is competitive. Okay, then no, I don't think they can be I, I mean, I don't believe that they can be competitive in 2022. I, I, I don't see how, I mean, I always try to, I mean, and look, I, I don't, I like what the Falcons did this offseason in terms of, you know, Drake London. I thought Desmond Ritter in the third round was a nice pickup. Uh, you know, they added some defensive depth in the second round. Um, Arnold Ebikidi is a nice uh, nice value pick there, too, in the second round. I, I, you know, I just think the problem for the Falcons is when they hired Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith, they were trying, and they said this, they said, like, like Terry Fontenot said this, that they were not going to rebuild. They were not. They, they they were they were trying to retool on the fly, and I think it would have been. And look, it, it worked out. It, it worked out how it worked out. The worst possible thing for them would have been if they traded for Watson, right? And and all of a sudden you're giving up tons of draft picks that are high in the draft, and Watson suspended for a year, and you've brought great shame to your organization, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that. Moving on from Matt Ryan and just taking the L on the salary cap hit and whatever it is now is the smartest thing for the Falcons. If, if, if Arthur Blank is going to be patient with Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith in this rebuild, and there's nothing to, you know, I mean, there's nothing to suggest he won't be, you know, you're in year two. I, I, I just look, they got Marcus Mariota, Desmond Ritter at the, at the quarterback position. And Marcus Mariota has been named the starter. Could he have a Renaissance in, in uh in atlanta possibly but he wasn't great under arthur smith in tennessee that's why they had to bring in ryan Tannehill. and you know you have you don't have a i don't think you have an elite offensive line by any stretch of the imagination you have kyle pitts and drake london so you have the start of something good in terms of receivers i just don't i don't i mean you know aj terrell and grady jarrett great players on the defensive side of the ball they've got you know some some higher caliber you know they have some players over on that. Like they, I, I cannot, I cannot envision a scenario where they win the AFC, the NFC South. Just can't. Yeah, that, and they're the one team where you can't envision them winning. Like I don't think the Panthers really have a chance, but I, there's at least like the small sliver you could be like, yeah, all right, I could see it being a total shocker and maybe happen. Uh, but no, it doesn't feel like the Falcons have any shots. So no, we agree on this. I think they'll steal some games for sure. But I, I just I just cannot see them like being a playoff team. It's it's and, and look, been wrong a lot, <laughs> wrong a lot every year, every week. I just can't see them being a playoff team. <laughs> Will Marcus Mariota finally establish himself as a, as an NFL starter? I mean, I think the over under for what's the over under for Desmond Ritter starts this year? I say it's like eight, eight and a half. Yeah, I don't think they just don't have a good enough team. There's not enough talent around him. He struggled with, I just don't think that Mario, this is going to be over at the end of the 2022 season. People are going to saying, Oh, that's a franchise quarterback. And uh, he's going to have a hot free agency and people are going to be out to get him. I, there's just like, I mean, you have a rookie. Well, they they, they Kyle up, Pitts every play. Well, you got Drake London too. Yeah. Uh, they have been up with the saints at home at the Rams at the Seahawks. So your two week probably road trip out there. Uh, Browns at home at Buccaneers, 49ers at home at the Bengals. Like what's their record after those seven games? Uh, two and five at best. Yeah. And so it's like at that point, if you're two and five or one and six or oh and seven, and I don't think they'll be oh and seven, but I, I, I don't think they will be th three and four or four and three at that point. Aren't you going to Desmond Ritter to see what he's got? You don't, you're not going to just definitely give an entire season to Marcus Mariota just because he's you know, your veteran. Right. You got to, yeah, that's it. I mean, you, you give Desmond Ritter a chance to sit down, learn, watch the game, 
And then once you feel like, all right, Marcus Mario is not doing anything for us anymore. Let's uh, let's put the rookie in there. Oh my god, their buy is an until like, <laughs> good lord, their buy is like. I think they have the last buy. It's the middle of December. That's insane. Yeah, which is that's tough. Uh, yeah, that's one of those. Were you looking to see? Hey, maybe they could go to Desmond or after yeah, the buy. Yeah, yeah. They're not waiting that long. <laughs> I was like, Where's this thing? Good God, they, they have four games after their buy in a seventeen game season. That is crazy, man. Yeah, that's not ideal unless you're a playoff contender. All right, finally, can Drake London instantly replace Calvin Ridley? Um, yes. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I feel like. London is talented enough, and it's not like Ridley was Hoyo Jones in his prime. Uh, and also, you know, you have Kyle Pitts there at tight end. He's going to take some pressure off the receiving core because teams have to account for him. So I could see Drake London having a big year. I, I mean, I think it's, I don't think that Kyle Pitts, I mean, excuse me, I don't think Drake London can replace 2020 Calvin Ridley, who had 90 catches for 1,300 yards and nine touchdowns. Man, he had, God, he had 10 touchdowns as a rookie, seven touchdowns in the second year. Just 800 yards in both and 60, 60 some catches in both. I, I think those first two years is replaceable. Maybe not the touchdown part, but like, I mean, I think Drake London can catch 70 passes for 800 or 900 yards. Um, and at the very least, you know, provide a second, a second legitimate weapon alongside Kyle Pitts that doesn't let defenses just completely zero in on the tight end. So there we go. All right. That's the NFC South. NFC South. NFC so South. House. Imagine how this offseason would have been different if Watson had gone to the Falcons or the Panthers. It's insane. Or the Saints or whoever. All the AFC, all the NFC South teams wanted them. I know. Imagine, I mean, it, it, the entire landscape of the NFL would be completely different. If you're the, I mean, if you're the Falcons, you cannot believe how lucky you, you're, you're, you're bummed you lost Matt Ryan because he's, you wanted to play for the franchise for his entire career. But I mean, you are, you're pretty glad you didn't get to Sean Watson. Oh, this would have set their franchise back five years. Yeah, oh, it, I mean, it would have devastated the franchise. Uh, all right. We'll be back uh, tomorrow for a mailbag or Monday for a mailbag if you listen. Mailbag. Oh, yeah, good call. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. For Breach, I'm Brinson. We'll see you guys later.